Fathers, brothers and sisters, I wasn't entirely clear about what I was supposed to speak about until um, yesterday in the evening, Father Peter actually told me what he was looking for. It told me what he was looking for. Um, the Orthodox ethos of the Holy Trinity Monastery monks. So I began to think, I thought, all right, uh, within that context, he gave me some hints, some guidance. Um, I could add on, so some of this is uh, academic, and then from my you know, own experience over the years, um, I might be able to add some things. We were close to uh, Archbishop John of San Francisco in the sense that Ludica took part in the consecration of our cathedral. Uh, the, there was great veneration when I entered to the monastery about 47 years ago of Ludica John. Uh, among the, the monks, the higher monks, their own personal one story I heard from uh, Metropolitan Lars, who I would come in to his office almost every day and stand at the, the doorway. And many, many times I would come and stand at the doorway and only one time he said, have a seat. Uh, because who was I to come into the, the abbot, the bishop's office and just sit down in front of him and start talking? So I stood there because it was normal. It seemed right to me. And I only understood the significance when he did say one time, have a seat. And then it was a very serious conversation he wanted to. And I remember even one of it, and this is, while I'm talking, I'm actually giving you some of the ethos of the fathers. Um, Vladika called me in, and there was something going on in the monastery. And Vladika had heard something about it, but he wasn't quite sure about it. Um, and he very kind of sternly said to me, what's going on? Uh, he said, uh, you, you know what's going on. I know you know what's going on. And why, why don't you tell me? Why, do, why haven't you told me what's going on? And I said, because I was able to, after the years, sense Vladika's pulse in the sense of, Vladika was a man of very few words, but even just a, just a slight expression, if you learn to read those expressions, it said everything. And this time he said, why didn't you tell me? And I thought, well, I'm going to just tell him the truth. And I said, Vladika, you know, when I tell you something, it's because I want you to know it. And if I don't tell you something, it's because I don't want you to know it. <laughs> and Vladika looks at me, and he said, yeah, Ponyol, I got it. <laughs> and he let me go. He let me go, and, and I knew from the expression it was, You'll take care of it. You know that, that that was it. So that was, and we heard about Vladika John on the the airplane. Well, we heard a lot of stories about Vladika John because where people were either coming in and out uh, to the seminary monastery from San Francisco, people that knew him, uh, lived, grew up with him, uh, listened to him, and there was a story on an airplane uh, that I was told that Vladika was on the airplane. And uh, there was a, a, an older man next to him. They were flying back to San Francisco. And the man said, you know, Vladika, we've asked you to please come and bless our house. You know, we've asked you a few times to come and bless our house. And Vladika, John just paused and he said, your house is blessed. <laughs> and the man looked out the window and they were just flying over his neighborhood as they came into San Francisco. Well, it's many, many, many s stories I heard um, concerning, concerning Lika John. And I heard it from people like Archimedrit Kiprian, who was our spiritual father, and who was many times asked by Vladika to come and paint a cathedral in San Francisco. It's a huge job. Uh, iconographically speaking. And for, he didn't never work, but when John died, all of a sudden, Father Kibran was going to San Francisco to paint the cathedral, and he said, Vladika got his way anyway uh, by, from the other world, um, bringing me out there every summer. He would go out there and spend some time. But I heard a story once from Vladika Lavra, who was um, serving in the altar, probably as a, either novice or subdeacon, when Vladika John would serve liturgy. And this is, this is very important for everybody to know. Vladika John would not allow any 
words to be spoken in the altar. In other words, zero conversation. Uh, even just by a sign, he would, wouldn't even tell people, get this from me or something. Just a sign, because there's a quote we have. I'm, I'm sorry I don't have it here. And it was given to me the day I was ordained a, uh, a deacon from St. Seraphim. Uh, of Sarov, and it said something to the extent of not even a hint of a word, anything, because we're in the presence of angels and the seraphim and the cherubim, and you dare not speak a human word in, the, in their presence in the altar. Now, of course, Vladika John lived this, and I heard this from Vladika Laris, and he said, after liturgy was over, Vladika John used to spend a, quite a lot of time praying in the altar after the liturgy. And the question was, Who's going to pack up Lydia John's suitcase with his vestments, et cetera, et cetera, and offer for him to leave? So Lydia Laris came in the altar, and he started asking Lydia these questions. You know, like, Lydia, where's your socos? Or do you want me to put it here or take it there? And Lydia just goes, it's not going to talk. <laughs> and Lydia Laris, again, uh, asks Lydia, you know, like he wants to help him. And Lydia John, no. Three times, and finally Vedika John took him by the cassock outside onto the kleros, and he said, now you can talk. So it's, a, it's a good example, right, about unfortunately people, not only what might be considered necessary to speak in the altar, but sometimes things that are totally unnecessary are spoken about. But this was Vedika John's uh, lesson to us, which I repeat to you, and which we've all heard. Uh, in the altar as well, sometimes, uh, when things get a little too uh, camaraderie or something like that's going on, which, you know, it's, 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 there's no place for that uh, in the altar. So th these are just um, introductory remarks. But like I said, I, I was planning something different. And what I have to let you know is that Jordanville is a, a very unusual combination of academia, that is the seminary, and a monastery. And this is normal for us. This is something organic. And since 1948, when the, the, monastery, the seminary was established, um, it, it grew together. It was actually established to educate monks because at the end of the Russian Empire, the revolution, et cetera, there was an idea that monks need to be educated. So educated monasticism, why? Because of the more and more influence of the secularization in the world and the fact that regular monastics have to have an answer for people that come to monasteries, et cetera, and want to know about the faith. They need to be able to share something with them, so they need some kind of education. Not that, not that academia or the seminary as such is necessary f for, for salvation, let's say. Uh, but, but nonetheless, this was taken to heart, and this and many other things continued after the fall of, of Holy Russia and uh, communism taking over both the country and, to a great degree, the church itself. So I have some things that I've just put together to let you know how closely these things are intertwined in Holy Trinity Seminary. So. I'll read and I'll speak, and then I have some stories because everybody likes stories, and as we just heard, it helps to convey something of the Orthodox ethos. The ethos of Holy Trinity Monastery was very intrinsically connected to the experience of the whole Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. We celebrated our 100th anniversary, and the monastery is celebrating its 90th, and they're interwoven very closely. In fact, just as an aside, our, the last monk, Father Job, Archimedri Job, just died. So that whole generation, that ethos that was conveyed to us, uh, and thank God I had the opportunity to meet and to live with these monks because over the years, because I was there early enough that they were still alive, more or less, all of them. Uh, there are a few that I missed, but they were talking about them all the time. And so I was able to speak to them, to watch them. We didn't have, we, we've never had in the monastery the, the establishment of what you would call eldership. Um, we had spiritual fathers, we had people that had come from a tradition 
that goes as far back as Kiev, actually, and it, and it flows right into Holy Trinity Monastery and seminary, for that matter. And I was able to speak to these, one monk it was my first year, I was walking along with him, and, and I mentioned something about, about a mood, uh, something, just the, the expression, uh, some kind of mood, and he, and he looked at me, and he said, is it possible that monastics are saved by their moods? And I was astounded because everybody wants to know, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Uh, what's your mood? You know, and everybody wants to be in a good mood. And suddenly I realized that up until that point of my life, I placed great emphasis on moods. And he was telling me, they don't mean anything. Moods are not what we're saved by. It's, there are other things. And I complained to another one of the monks, and I said something about the specific mood of melancholy, which for some reason I thought, because of my background, my education, melancholy was a, a very 19th century thing that you know young people would cultivate, and I unfortunately did a lot of cultivation, and <laughs> of of melancholy. And if somebody said, "You really do wallow in on we, don't you?" But I don't now. But I'm, I was speaking to an older monk, Archimandri Vladimir, uh, who's of course passed passed on. And I was going, and he, and he was, he was in the, the, the bread room cutting up um, stale bread into little pieces, which he used to feed the birds outside of the business office. He had a little shelf, and he put out these crumbs. And I said something about melancholy, melancholy. And, and he said, what is melancholy? And he keeps cutting up the bread. And I said, it's this or that. And he said, no, no, no. What is melancholy? And he's cutting up the bread. And I said, I think it's, it's this or that or, I don't know, sweet sadness or some ridiculous uh, expression, as Pushkin said, in sorrow is my joy. Um, and I went on and he said, what is melancholy? And, I, and, and he said, no, no, he keeps cutting up. He says, it's a passion. And he keeps cutting up. And I thought, oh, <laughs> there, now I have a lot of work to do um, because I thought it was a very nice, sweet feeling that you need to cultivate to the nth degree. And now I find that it's just another passion. <laughs> so these are, you know, walking along, talking, you know, I, I said to another monk, did you hear that somebody got offended and they refused to teach in the, in, in the seminary or something? They didn't have access to the, the latest toy, the Xerox machine or something was going on like that. And he just went like this. He says, ha, 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 ha. Is it possible for a monk uh, to, to get offended? Uh -huh. And he just kept walking. And I thought, oh, no, here it is again. You know, well, I thought there was injustice because they didn't give him a key to the room where the Xerox machine was. And all I was told was he had no right to be offended. That's just the monk doesn't do that. Um, so it, it goes on and on and on, these little stories. So again, the connection between Father Peter was able to, by a miracle, be able to print a very important work because one of our former metropolitans, Metropolitan Vitali Ustino, said one of the great illnesses of the 20th century is the weakness in the understanding of ecclesiology in the church. What are the boundaries of the church? And as you know, that the Russian Orthodox Church, through the grace of God, produced the anathema against ecumenism in order to bring to people's attention that like every family, every organization, no matter what it is, community has boundaries. And you can't just have orthodoxy, L-I-T-E. You can't, every house has rules. The church has to have boundaries. And so we produced, uh, why? Because there was a report to our council of bishops back, it was in the 80s, about just what's going on in the heterodox world, et cetera, the Roman Catholics consecrating pizza and Coke as, as their Eucharist, and many abnormalities, et cetera, and the bishop said, that's it. Uh, we're going to baptize everyone, and this ecumenist, anti-ecumenist, the anathema, uh, was created. But this is, I'm going to try to get back to what I started with, to explain to you how all of this gets intertwined in the ethos of the monastics and 
the, the Church Abroad and Holy Trinity Monastery. The exiles of which we're talking about and are all gone now in our, in our community, especially those who were intellectually conscious of Russian church history, were formed by the so-called Russian religious renaissance. And this movement grew out of the increasingly acute awareness of the weakness of Russian Orthodox theology, throughout which has been because of a historical process, which I'm not going to describe here. And it was influenced, unfortunately, by Western ideas. Some of you might know about this. But thanks to the example of a layman, although a layman of a the higher echelons, a, a, a lower, lesser nobleman, Alexei Homyakov, who you might have heard of, and his profound influence on the patristic legacy, he created a, an awareness in the 19th century of this weakness, and specifically in the ecclesiology of the Russian Orthodox Church. And he affected the direction of Russian religious thought at the end of the 19th century to the extent that Metropolitan Anthony Khrapovitsky, who was initiator or the leader of our church, said Russian Orthodox theology has now become Homyakov theology. So great was his influence. And of course, this was primarily, primarily centered around the title of his most famous work, The Church is One. And we all, this is probably very familiar to you that the church is one, but this was something special. In fact, most of Homyakov's writings had to be published in French because they were a little bit too strong for the direction already that Rus Russian Orthodox theology had, had already taken. Of course, then they were uh, translated into Russian, of course, and, and they became extremely influential. And because of him, we have the phenomena of the new Hiram Martyr, Ilarion Troitsky, whose major theme was the church. Where is the church and what is the church? So the, the schools were changed. The, the movement took, had a life of its own, and it de redirected the, the Russian church's attitude towards the church in terms of theology and towards the heterodox. What are we going to do with those who are outside of the church? And Metropolitan Anthony Krapovitsky was one of the main um, formers of this and teacher of this idea of the church is one, uh, and we need to rid it of any Western type of influence. And this is what got, and the idea of revitalizing <laughs> the patristic legacy within the Russian church. As an aside, I taught, and I'm still teaching, um, because the, the, the tradition in our monastery and seminary is to wring out the monks and the teachers until there's nothing left to wring out of them. <laughs> um, uh, so you just keep going and doing what you're doing, whether it's your baking bread or your teaching in seminary. And then this year they said, and we'll give you another course now for you to teach. And it's like enough is enough. But but um, this this revitalization, what happened was. Um, communism came and a whole generation of Russian Orthodox monastic clergy and lay clergy had been infused with this new Russian renaissance of spirituality based on the patristic legacy, the doctrine of the church, the dogma of the church is the title of that book. And that continued in the Russian church abroad. Whereas sort of the Iron Curtain came down, and unfortunately, and you can discover this, the Moscow Patriarchate is in many ways still somewhat stuck in the 19th century, well, because of circumstances so under communism. So, but this movement continued with us, and we have proponents of it with Father Michael Pomazansky, uh, Archbishop of Erke. We've published a book called The Struggle for Virtue, and he influenced not only clergy, that is white clergy, but the monastics in the monastery were very much moved by and took an interest. And even the simplest of our monks 
there's five or six volumes of the sermons and speeches or talks of Vladik Archbishop of Erki. And the simplest of these of our monks, because I give you a little story because I worked with one of them for quite a number of years. They read all of this and they were they became like in a way amateur or mini preachers of this idea of like this is it. The church is one. And this is our relationship to that idea and the relationship to the rest of the world. And of course, the idea of baptizing, the heterodox, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the new martyrs and confessors of Russia as that generation, which was taught by these people, uh, including um, Metropolitan Anthony Khapovitsky and also Homyakov and the new martyr Alarion, one of the major factors that influenced them in a way to become martyrs, or what ended up them becoming martyrs, was the struggle with Sergianism. And Sergianism is, as some have noted, is an ecclesiological heresy. And the reason why they were so, they were so capable of discerning, in a way, the danger that happened in Russia, first, the communists would kill you or persecute you or put you in prison because you were an Orthodox Christian. And then the next stage in the devil's workshop was they would do the same thing if you belonged to the wrong church. That is, if you didn't, the church that was being you know, formed by the communist government under Metropolitan, later for one year, Patriarch Sergius, this was another reason why you could be arrested or killed or put in prison. And by and large, the new martyr said no to that. And they were able to say no to that because they had been cultivated in this concept of the dogma of the church. So when they looked at what was going on, for us, most people today, especially here in this room, these are fine points that I'm not quite sure if anybody would really fully understand uh, what's the significance, but people died. They actually gave their lives up rather than go to that church. So. This could happen in our lifetime as well because of the increase, constant increase in encroachment of ecumenism and the sort of erasing of the borders of the church in many different ways, not only in just the concept, but even in the practice, especially with, which unfortunately in some ways, which I don't have time today to talk about, the direction of what we would call American orthodoxy. And this is why conferences like this are so important in order to ground people in something which I only learned recently from some of our uh, convert clergy in the South, down in the South, we have something that's lightly called Orthodox Dixie. Um, but I learned that there is actually a difference. And one of the clergymen told me, he said, you probably think that people come to, to, to Orthodoxy for X number of reasons. And one of the reasons is because they're looking for something conservative. And I said, well, yes, because we are against these things. This is why a lot of people convert. He says, that's true. They want something conservative, but rarely do they want something traditional. And all of a sudden, I realized that there's a difference between just conservative and traditional. And many people who are satisfied with conservative don't want anything to do with traditional because it's too foreign to them. But you really can't have orthodoxy without traditionalism. You have to have traditional. And the people will, they begin to say, that's the old country, this is nationalism, this is culture. This is something also that I, that is important to us. And of course, it's been a, a major factor in the Russian churches, the Russian church abroad's outreach towards the non-Orthodox community. To become, you have a choice, unfortunately, or fortunately, America is much of a smorgasbord uh, with the different churches. But what happens is that you can go and get something that is a little easier for you to transition to. But if you come into the Russian church abroad, there, it's more difficult. People admit this up front because 
it has more of tradition, which some people think it shackles them in the sense of something cultural. You're not going to, if you saw my Greek wedding or something, it's not the idea of you're baptized and then you're Greek, or uh, you're baptized and you're Russian, no. It's the orthodox ethos that matters. And this is grounded in not just 2,000 years of practice, which Metropolitan Loris, actually, as I discussed many times with him, uh, especially in my younger years in the seminary, I was very uh, set on theology, theological points uh, and points of ecclesiology. And Vladika would just kind of bear with me and listen to me. And, and he looked again, looked up again, and, and he very strictly said to me, first behavior and then theology. And I thought, oh. There we go again. But doesn't theology matter? Doesn't it matter? But he said, first practice and then theology. So I kind of managed to bring that together and say that you can't have one without the other. And there's an interesting work called the, 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 um, the, the moral, the, something, the morality of orthodox theology, uh, of orthodox dogmatic theology by Metropolitan Anthony Krapovitsky, who saw theology as a form of, reality, of morality. So that's another, another, another thought. Uh, so this movement continued among the exiles um, in, our, in our monastery, especially since we've educated so many generations. And Father Michael Pomazansky, Father uh, Bishop Averki were proponents of this. Father Michael lived, I knew him well, he was 90 years old. You've probably read Orthodox Dogmatic Theology, which was translated specific, especially by Father Sir from Rose, because he saw how important that book was. Father Michael was 90 years old, and my, I was the last class that he taught. And he didn't teach with any notes or with any books. He was the last living graduate of the pre-revolutionary Kievian academy, uh, theological academy. And he was really an embodiment of this. Not in the terms of, not in the sense of dogma, not in the sense of theology, because he had that. He was able to just speak dogmatic theology. But the way he lived, for many years before he died, he lived alone. His wife had an operation, and something went wrong, and she had a stroke, and she ended up for the rest of her life in a nursing home. So Father Michael lived in the monastery like a monk. And every time I would knock on his door, he lived in the seminary dorm, he would say, come in, and he was standing at his aneloy. And one time I went in there, and he was reading the Psalms, literally all the time. I never went in there, and Father Michael wasn't standing at his analoid. And I would, for one year, I would drive the older monks around to the doctors, talk to them in the car, listen to them, and I talked to Father Michael. I, I took him to a doctor one day, and we left the doctor's office, and he was very, Father Michael was very, very quiet, very soft-spoken. It was like, you could speak like this. And I said, he said, oh, why is it that people have to have noise? Because in the doctor's office, there's music or something going on. He says, why? He says, I don't understand why they always have to have noise. And then I was driving along, and I said, you know, Father Michael, what do you do? Like, in the, the Desert Fathers, the Desert Fathers are in the desert. But how do they fulfill the law of love? Because we're saved through our neighbor. We have to love our neighbor. And he said, they loved the birds. And I thought, oh, there it is again. Why is it that I, you have to think of it in such concrete terms, like I have to love you? It's love that matters. And he pulled it out of the whole picture of human interaction and threw it into the birds. But it was important that they loved. That is what's the function. That's what's going on. So I listened to things like that. We would ask him questions in class, and he would always pause, and there was one time, and he never just spoke quickly and gave an answer. It was always well thought out. And one time, he didn't give the answer. I asked something, I remember, and he, he just, he, he didn't say, I don't know. He said, I, usually, I'll think about it. And like three hours later, I heard something like this by my door, and there was a slip of paper slipped under my door, and I opened it up, 
It was a perfect answer to my question from the, and that's, that was, and there was a, this is very typical of, of that generation. Um, it was very frustrating to deal with the Abbott many times, Metropolitan Loris, because he had, actually it was almost like a mantra. You would offer him something. I, I said, well, look, I have an idea. And he says, should monks have ideas? You know, and I thought, oh no. I thought this would be really a good idea for the monastery. And he said, no, all right, what is it? What is it you want to? So I told him, and he, he said, oh, OK. He would say, like, OK, try try it out. But, uh, but he always, and this is very important in the spiritual life, Vodika, over and over, we would go, or I would go, and he used the same thing over and over. He'd just go, postmortem, which means, well, we'll see. And I thought, can't you give me an answer? Oh, I need an answer. And postmortem. But after a while, and now I realize it myself, having to do the things that he had to do, is that Vodika always emphasized that it wasn't we'll see, it's that we'll pray about it. And Vodika waited for the voice of God. He waited for a movement of the spirit. He waited until he somehow felt that within the good sense of feelings, which are basically like monkeys in the forest fire, they're jumping all over the place. He waited until, because he was a very centered, what I discovered, he really was raised in a monastery. He was this tall, and that was his whole life. Um, when I w took over, I'm in his office now, and his, his chair, et cetera, everything's, and there's still some of his books. On the um, on the bookshelf there, I didn't change anything. And one time, for when I was teaching petrology, I took down the two volumes of Simeon, the New Theologian, in in Russian. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just back back then we were teaching actually in Russian. And I took them down and I opened them up and I started leafing through. And here are all these notes and underlines. Vladika read everything. He read both volumes of Simeon and the Theologian. And so again, I thought, oh. So these answers, like we'll see, or something, this was based on his absorption and of the other monks' absorption of the patristic literature, the patristic tradition. So uh, it, con it conveys an enormous amount of information in very small little phrases, few words, um, maybe just expressions. And another thing that I basically you know, covered, um, mm, another thing is why the Russian church abroad, what about St. Job of Bachaev? How many of you have never heard of St. Job of Bachaev? I never heard of it. Well, OK, St. Job of Bachaev, very important. Southern Russia, that one of the great lavras of great monasteries of Russia. St. Job, his struggle was against the Roman Catholic Unions in, in southern Russia. So he was f foremost a missionary, especially among the, these heterodox Roman Catholic Unions, which is a very insidious way of bringing people out of orthodoxy in. What happens, why is so, this is the church abroad. Our monastery in Munich is named the patron of St. Job of Pachayev. In Montreal, the monastery was named St. Job of Pachayev. In San Paulo in South America, the monastery is named after St. Job of Pachayev. Holy Trinity Monastery has its patron, especially if it's printing press and of all our publications, St. Job of Pachayev. We read a prayer to St. Job of Pachayev it, every day at the end of the midnight office. And, and one of the things it says, he brought a multitude of, of monks because of his ad adherence to orthodoxy. So we, are all, we were all raised with this idea that it's true boundaried orthodoxy and a defense of it is something that's intrinsic to our lives. And this is part of the ethos of only, only, even now, of course, we have this is still going on. The tradition is still going on. And these little guides, sayings, especially in ecclesiology and centering in the boundaries and the idea of tradition, that you know you don't change things. We're only here. We're only passing through. Just because you're St. George's Orthodox Church, it doesn't mean that you own it. It's that something you can, you can manipulate it. And this is the way we do it. 
and that's it. It's very, there's an important phrase because this is the way it's always been done. And it's just like an iconography. In iconography, if you, if you don't know the rules, you're gonna make a mess. And Father Kiprian, our iconographer, was just beside himself when people would just joyfully come into the studio and show him their icon, and he would be like, that's awful. And that was the kind of person he was. He did not it cater to people in the sense of man-pleasing. And he would, they would go, and I worked with him, painting icons for years, and he said, you know, why are they, why? there should be a law, he says. They should be trained in the orthodox iconographic tradition and be forbidden to paint icons. Well, this, this happens also in, in our piety and our ethos. It's, but what happens is when an iconographer has been really well trained, it's amazing how much creativity you can exhibit within the tradition. A, an iconographer will paint 50 icons of the same saint or the mother of God, and each one is somehow different. And he brings within the tradition, and the same thing is it's not that we always have done it this way. We can do it this way because it's always been done, but everybody does it in their own way because we're all individuals and we all have, somehow we bring our own creativity. As we say, there are as many saints and, and as many personalities as there are people, but there's only one Holy Spirit, which manifests itself in a different way in each different person, but within this context. And the last thing I want to say is something that I learned in the monastery on a, on a personal level. When I came to the monastery, I was much, of course, younger, and I had been very well educated. Uh, and what it did was some of it was profitable, but some of it wasn't, in the sense of it created, like, it, it turned my mind or my brain into iron. It was extremely strong, a very powerful thinking process. And one of the things that I discovered that a monk must be, and one of the virtues who he, which, which he must attain to, it, and that's for all Orthodox tradition, and that is holy simplicity, grace-filled simplicity. And I'm not talking about simpletons. This is a real, like, humility, patience. And how am I going to be simple? How can I possibly do with all this in my mind, like like steel, a steeled mind is what, it, and I read somewhere, do, attach yourself to a pious, simple person. And, and what happened was I was assigned to the garden and the gardener was monk Germagen, who's of course gone now. He was a simple Ukrainian peasant who was in exile also in Canada, and he was either ran or was part of a raspberry farm. And he came to Jordanville, he was a tantra de monk, and he did our gardening, the vegetable gardens. And this was my, my first obedience. So I thought to myself, all right, Father Gim again will be my elder. I will do everything he tells me to do. I will think like he thinks. I will act like he thinks. Everything, I will just, mimic because that's the way it begins. You begin by habit, by imitating, and then you know the, the soul takes its tone from the body. So I'm out there and he says, here, take this hoe and go down these rows. And I'm out there with all my education out there hoeing and, and doing these things. And it, it went on and on and like this. And after a while, the steel started to, it got softer. And there was one amazing example. We, we, were, we ordered little cabbage plants, you see, to plant. And we did the rows of cabbage plants. And we'd come in the morning, and the cabbage plants would be, they fell over. And we discovered there's a cabbage worm that bites you know, the bottom of the, the stalk of the little plant. And that's the end of the plant. So what are we going to do? Well, I have nothing to say because I'm just nothing here. Father Gambigan makes all the decisions here because I need to get rid of this steel mind of mine and just obtain that very, very pious, but very, very simple. As one of the monks said, if you got any simpler, you'd have to water him, you know, so, but that was, that was good. That was, so the neighbor said, you know, I don't know if you have it anymore. It's called Parson Sudsy Ammonia. 
it comes in a jar, whether they're selling that, or they use it to wash or clean things with. And they said, mix it with water. We have an old tractor in a big barrel, and you're going to spray the mixture of water and Parsons sudsy ammonia on all these plants. We plant them again, buy some more plants. We come in the morning, boom, they're over again. Well, they were using it as like a salad dressing. Uh, they, they enjoyed it. And so, well, we didn't know what to do. And I'm not getting involved. So, because I can't, because I've said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to show how smart I am. So we had to go to the local store somewhere and I needed to translate for him. So we went to the, to the, uh, to the store where they sell what grain or whatever, gardening things. And Father Gim again is getting some things. He and I'm standing around and looking, and I see this little jar uh, of of, uh, of something on the shelf, and it says it's something to to kill cabbage worms. Um, and I thought, uh, this is you know we keep buying more and more cabbage plants, and they're just licking up all of this so-called you know sudsy pneumonia stuff. And I just took it off the shelf and I went to Father Gim and I said, Father Gim again, you know, this says, this is for, to, to stop the cabbage worms. And he said, you know, good, good. You know, he wasn't against me being so smart. It's just that I just obeyed him completely. And so we took it, we went back, we got the barrel out, filled up with water, we poured in this, and the water turned all kind of a milky white and we're spraying up and down the rows. Up and, and the next, next day, the cabbage plants are still growing. And and, and and then I heard from one of the neighbors, he was ecstatic, Father Gim again. And he said to the neighbor, he said, you know, he said, we found out how to take care of the cabbage. He said, Brother Mark, he said, Brother Mark discovered this, discovered this. And he said, he reads. <laughs> <laughs>